The world's largest international airline is charting an aggressive path forward coming out of the pandemic. Emirates President Tim Clark says the company's growth plan could include big orders from Airbus and Boeing to bolster its fleet of jumbo jets. Clark spoke about the airline's plans with host Guy Johnson at the Lisbon Aviation Festival. Demand has been very strong. Is it going to continue to be very strong? How do you see the winter? How do you see 2024? Well, our forward bookings are very strong throughout the rest of the financial year, going through the winter till March 31st. So, yeah, it's looking good. Does, does the, the period of revenge travel, I think, as a lot of people are calling it, is that coming to an end? Though? This is an interesting term. I'm, 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 I'm not sure I recognise it. Um, if there had been re- revenge travel, we would have seen uh, a tapering of the demand, but we haven't seen that. Right. Um, we, we've got problems like the Sudan situation, Ethiopia, whatever it may be. But, but in terms of the trunk operations, Africa in general, uh, Oceania, South America, yep. Europe, very strong and continue to be strong. Thank goodness we had the 380s. <laughs> You're not going to let that one go. Um, <laughs> is the market becoming more price sensitive though? As far as we can see, no. Um, and this is the interesting one. For, for all the years I've been in this business and the bounce back has always happened whether it be 9-11, the Gulf Wars, et cetera, et cetera, the financial crisis. We've always bounced back in, in a very robust uh, manner. And I, I, when I looked at COVID, I thought this will be something even bigger than that. But in each of these crises, you've seen a return to equilibrium far sooner than it has in this particular case. So what we're looking at now is uh, a sustained demand at higher prices coming at us for every seat we offer on many of our routes there are about three people who want it the spill rate is very high and we can't see anything changing on that now right. there, there have been a few changes in the sense that Dubai has now become a truly global metropolis and it, it, its brand has extended all over the world so people want to come there they are moving there in large numbers lots of Brits coming down there yep. to live and work so that has been slightly transformational in, in the, the structure of the demand segments and that means generally higher yields. But in all the sick freedom markets, the cross flows that we see, it's been extraordinarily strong and robust and looks like it's staying that way. Is it strong enough, is it strong enough to sustain significantly higher, fare, higher oil prices? Are you, are you, do you suck that, that cost up or can you pass it on? Is demand strong enough for you to pass it on? Well, look, we, we, we have what we call the floating surcharge. As the oil price moves, we put the, the surcharge yep. goes up and down with it. I mean, I, I, and there's no hit demand when, the, when it goes up. Not, no, it isn't. So the price in, in, in elasticities are quite a shock to us, to be quite honest. Yep. Um, you know, when we came through COVID, I basically said to the business, basically, we're going to spend more on product and doing a lot better than we did before, rather than going south and cutting front end products, which is what we've done. Yep. Um, and we've been able to afford that simply because the demand has been so strong. So. Long may it last. I mean, I, I cannot say two, three, four years what's going to happen. All I, I think I've got right in the in the forecasting that the world would move very quickly after the end yep. of COVID, which is what it did. We positioned ourselves on that basis. It was high risk, taking all the crews back, getting the aircraft ready for it. Fortunately, came came good, and so we were able to to capitalize yep. on that. So we will continue to to grow our fleet. Uh, you know, I, I look at post COVID as a third era for us, third epoch. I'm very optimistic about it. We talk about AI, the embracement of technology, making us far more efficient in what we do. Um, fleet are becoming far more efficient in terms of design, propulsion, yep. etc. I think it's quite a good story. Um, notwithstanding oil as it is, as I said earlier, it'll settle back. We've been up at 100, 110 before. Crack spread is a worry. Uh, but so far, the markets are taking the price points that are a result of what we're having to face to, to deliver the... Uh, the uh, margins that we need okay. to keep going. Um, you are one of the world's biggest uh, buyers of aeroplanes. Um, you still are clearly in love with the, um, the A380, but you can't buy any more of those. So the question then comes, what are you going to buy? Uh, and in what time frame are you going to be buying them? You made a hiring announcement a few days ago. We all kind of sat up and paid attention to what you were saying. And the reason that, that, you, that we sat up and paid attention was you talked about hiring from a number of different aircraft types, but you didn't mention the 787. Is that significant? Well, look, the 787 isn't in the short-term picture at yep. this point in time. Right. Yes, we're talking to Boeing about the 787. We quite like the aeroplane. 
of there's course. no news coming at Dubai, the, the Dubai Air Show. What's the space? What's okay. the space? Um, as I said, we're in talks with Boeing as we are with Airbus. Yep. And we are hiring large numbers of crew. Many, many of those will be direct entry captains onto the 380s or whatever, simply because we're moving some of those pilots onto the 350s, which start arriving in July, August of next yep. year. And we have 50 of those being delivered in rapid order. So we have to move our pilots around. So we need, we, we know we have to recruit. The 7779 is hopefully coming at the end of 25. Uh, the 350s next year, we need more nines probably in the future because of the retirement of the 380s. We're looking at the 35001 uh, quite seriously. Still got propulsion issues with rolls. Hopefully they'll get resolved in the next couple of years. So to the point I made earlier about the new era, yes, we've got a lot of big plans for the airline going forward. New fleet, larger numbers, larger network, um, working with Fly Dubai. So it's, I think it's going to be quite a good story. We've learned a lot from COVID. It reset our thinking, yep. reset our processes. Um, and, and, and we came out of that having made the largest profit we've ever made last year. Um, and this year, it's going some. Final question. The UAE is about to host COP28. Huge event. Sustainability, aviation sustainability, front and center. The cost of making this industry sustainable. Are we being honest about it? Do you think the do you think this is do you think the aviation industry will have to be smaller given how expensive the fuels are going to be? Do you think people will be flying less because of how expensive fuel is going to be if this industry is truly to make its targets at 2050? Well, I, I to deal with the first question are these char targets achievable? Are we really kidding ourselves into what we can do? At the moment, technology is there for us to do whatever it may be, ESAF, hydrogen, etc. The scaling of that technology and the power required to scale, as well as all the other bits and pieces, is not there yet. Okay, so we need to set back. And I would like to see, we talked about it on the stage earlier, I'd like to see some kind of body, if it's under the UN, under ICAO, where they actually thrash out the issues of civil aviation going forward, rather than take views about mandates and punitive penalties and carbon credits, etc. What is the truth of all this? Ask yourself, what is the truth? And how are we going to deal with it? And then publicize that, whether it's good reading or not. Yep. It's the statement of truth rather than being caught out all the time and coming up against multiple governments with different agendas as to how you deal with this. And in, in the end, it will be huge and punitive. And in the end, it'll cost more to fly. Do we want that? No, we don't. The global population continues to grow. We must recognize that as the population grows, demand will be in lockstep with that, probably even more as we become. Yep. Look, roll forward five years, 10 years. We'll be on a three-day week, okay? You'll have robotics driven by AI. You'll have a lot of the menial tasks. I'm sorry, this is probably heresy to a lot of people. Yep. Those tasks will be done using the power of information, uh, 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 artificial intelligence, and robotics will be increasing at a pace, a lot of which we don't see because they are in another sphere used for other purposes, but eventually it'll break out. That will create more leisure time, more, uh, and uh, providing the wealth created by technology is distributed fairly and evenly and not withheld by a few for the few, then you can see more leisure in people's lives, their ability to determine what they want to do. Hopefully that'll be travel. They'll want to go and see things, not just staycations, but look at the world because now digital technology is providing a fantastic 5G OLED yep. screen in front of you, which you could almost be there if you wanted to. So where I see this taking us is that a human having more leisure time, more dis disposable income on the basis that it is distributed fairly. But technology can get us there now. This is the difficult. How do you deal with that? It's not just aviation. But how do you deal with large elements of the workforce who don't benefit from that uh, wonderful thing in the developing world? They are the ones that will be disadvantaged. How do you deal with that? Because it'll get into the question of the morality of what we're doing and yeah. fairness and in sort of egalitarian approach to how we do it. And that's the way I look at it. The aviation industry is one of many that has to face that. But in the end, if you cherry pick and you don't come up with something that is well understood, the messaging is clearly wrong at the moment, 
And um, and I, I, you know, COP28, the, the UAE has got a fantastic story to tell. I mean, we're talking about Dubai being powered, 40% of its power, solar in the next few years. You have nuclear being produced there. You've got vast solar arrays. You've got green hydrogen. They have the funds to be able to develop the technology. A lot of the countries appearing in COP28 don't have that money. Yep. So if these uh, countries like the UA use that financial strength to embrace, refine, sorry, wrong word, but to, to, to understand how this is going to work and scale it, whether it be SAF, whether it be ESAF, etc., that's a great story that comes out of it. But unfortunately, it gets kind of marginalized in some respects by aviation or you know, two percent of what yeah. it's all about, um, and and you, we remain the whipping boy, <laughs> unfortunately, because we're not messaging across. I'm a great believer in say, saying it as it is, and we are the first to embrace anything that's thrown at us that removes carbon from our the way we go about our business. Unfortunately, I don't see that at the moment. Didn't expect to finish there, Tim. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. That's Emirates President Tim Clark speaking with Guy Johnson about his company's growth plan from the Lisbon Aviation Festival. To hear more conversations like this one, subscribe to the Bloomberg Talks podcast, available on your favorite podcast platform.